Welcome. It is Wednesday, November 29th. We are on the other side of Thanksgiving, and we're glad that you all are here. We have a lot of student questions that we want to get to today, a couple of announcements, things that are going on. But I hope everybody had a good Thanksgiving. And now we roll into the, the holiday season, and this becomes a really challenging time to study because there's so many other competing things going on in our private lives and our family lives. I know that, that you went through this, Amanda, and it's not easy, is it? No, not at all. I, I do remember spending time with my in-laws that year and kind of having to either wake up early to put time aside or just take some time alone to say, okay, this is my study time. Like just still enjoy the holiday. But, um, and that can be hard because people are, Oh, we, we want to hang out. We want to spend time with you and things like that. Um, and that's not to say they don't wish you well. But you can be pulled in numerous directions in general around this time of the year. Never mind if you're studying for the bar exam. Absolutely. So we understand the challenges that come with that. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in some of the questions we got today. I want to turn to an item that's in the bar exam world news that some of you have obviously been hearing about, or maybe all of you, and it's this alternative pathways to licensure. What's happening here is that we've got a couple of jurisdictions, primarily Oregon and Washington, but now potentially California, that are considering or have implemented an alternative pathway to licensure other than the bar exam. And I am getting bombarded with questions on social media in particular from people not in our course saying, does that mean that I can become a lawyer without taking the bar exam? The answer is maybe, maybe. I've had some people say, do I have to go to law school now to take to become a lawyer? Yes, you, you still have to take <laughs> license. But let, the alternative pathways, and I want to talk about California in particular because this is the one that's most complicated. The state bar trustees have said that they are in favor of, of an alternative path to licensure. That's a big step in a state like California. The California Supreme Court will make the ultimate decision about whether or not to offer this program. That's all good news. The bad news is right now the program covers a total of 100 people who are in the provisional licensing program in California. As it's anticipated, it would probably only cover people who have or just now graduating from law school in California or in an online course based in California. And there will be a number of procedural hurdles for these applicants to go through. You'll need four to six months worth of work with a licensed attorney. So somebody's got to hire you and be willing to pay you. Then they've got to figure out if the work is really yours and not the attorney you're working for. Then they've got to decide who it applies to. Most likely foreign trained attorneys unless they can get hired by someone, will not have the opportunity to sit for this. I think it's only going to be uh, people that have graduated from ABA or state accredited law schools. So all of that is to say that while we're excited about the possibility of alternative paths to licensure, I would say it, it impacts almost no one that we talk to typically here at Celebration Bar Review, as most of our students are either read takers or people who are licensed and have been out of law school for a long time. Just wanted to put that out there. It's an interesting program, but I know some of you are thinking, well, maybe I won't have to take the bar exam. If you're listening to us today, almost certainly you will have to take a bar exam. Now, could be the existing bar exam. It may be a, the next generation. I know, Tracy, you've been working on the next gen materials for us, and that's still a few years away. A couple of years away. Yes. And it's being well, developed well. now. So we don't even have a full model to, to look at yet. Yeah. So we're still a long way away. So I think the net on this is if you are taking the bar exam, if you have taken the bar exam, you are not going to be eligible for this uh, program. Uh, could that change in the future? Possibly. Could we see it in more states? Maybe. But we don't even know if it's going to happen in California yet. So just uh, keep, keep an eye on that. And I know, Amanda, you've been a, a real advocate of this Alternative Pathways program. So it's good news in some ways, but it's also a little misleading to people right now, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. And the fact that it's coming, you just have to maybe accept 
this might not be the path that I can take. This is my past relationship right now is looking like the test, but it's great that it might be available in the future to promote diversity within the bar and eliminate some barriers to the being a member of the bar right now. Yeah, and, and we're in favor of that. I will say that I'm, I'm pretty excited. We had some great successes in the California bar exam. Those are the last results that came out. And we've been doing some interviews and encourage you to watch those. They're really, there's a consistent theme in these interviews we do with successful students. They tell us that they just trusted the process and they didn't give up. I, that's really true. We had a student that took the Cal bar eight times before they passed. We had another one that took it six times before they passed. Not all with us, to be clear. But I think the, the reality is you can pass these exams anywhere, but you need to be aware that this is what you're going to have to do. Yeah, we'll keep an eye on the alternative pathways and those discussions and the next generation exam. But for now, the world stays pretty much as it is. All right. I wanted to next talk about a, uh, a program that we're going to offer called the Bar Prep Boot Camp Booster. What did it made me think of all that alliteration? Anyway, the Booster is a two day online seminar that we're doing via Zoom. And we have selected the dates for it now. It's December 16th and 17th. So that's a Saturday, Sunday on Zoom from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Mountain Time, Mountain Standard Time. And what we're going to do at Booster is to take the, the skills that we've taught you at Boot Camp and we're going to expand them. I'm going to talk about how to activate what you photo read. I'm not going to teach photo reading again, per se. We'll assume everyone there is either a photo reader or learning photo reading. And then we're going to talk about essay writing and performance tests and MBEs and mindset and the study process. So we're going to do it in small breakout rooms. And we'll do it via Zoom. We've made this a very affordable program. Not been to any of our live boot camps. The fee is $800 for the two days. And you can pay that in full or you can spread it out over payments using our third-party programs like Klarna, Affirm and after pay. If you have been to one of our boot camps, you get a $200 credit. And so your fee is only $600. Pretty inexpensive to attend for a couple of extra days of training with our coaches and our team. In order to participate, you need to make a deposit of $100 to hold your seat. And that's a fully refundable deposit. We obviously have to have enough people register to make a class. We think we've got enough people who've expressed interest. Certainly right now we've got some deposits that have already come in. So people are starting to reserve seats. And so if you're interested, I want you to check out that link, make your hundred dollar refundable deposit, and then we will send you an invoice and give you the opportunity to pay the balance that's due. I think it's going to be a great program. I'm really excited about it. Tracy, What's your take on this booster? I think it will be a good timing and a good program for people who are well into their studies. Yeah. I think what it will do is give you some one-on-one -on -one time with the coaches that you don't have in other forums over a, an intensive two-day period to really hone in on your skills. So I'm, I think it'll be good for you and we're, we're excited to offer it. It's the first time we're offering it. If it, uh, if it goes over and, and uh, we get enough uh, to sign up, we will do it again uh, before the uh, July exam as well. So I, in my experience that a lot of people come to boot camp, they learn these, mm -hmm. then they need some additional push to get over the top. And, and so it's not like you just show up at boot camp and then voila, you're, you're passing the bar exam. This is an opportunity to do that. And I know Amanda, you got to be at your first live boot camp. Fun to think about coming in and, and, and pushing that and boosting a little bit, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's great. And I think, like you said, sometimes this can really get people the traction that they need. And again, expanding it is amazing because lots of people couldn't travel for work, family related reasons. So I think it's great that we're given a little booster. Yeah. So we hope you'll register for this. We will make a go, no go decision based on those registrations over the next uh, week or so, but we are uh, holding those dates open. Save the dates, December 16th and 17th online. 
should be an exciting uh, opportunity for everybody. All right. I want to get to the questions. It's been a couple of weeks since we've done a, a, a Q&A because of uh, the holidays. And we do have a lot of questions. And uh, Brianna couldn't join us today. And I don't see Bobka, but Amanda and Tracy and I and June will uh, will struggle through these. So let's go ahead and jump into them. First question we got, uh, and these are in no particular order. This student said, I was reviewing the course and found some of the videos are geared towards the July 2023 exam. Is there new content that I need to request for the February exam? The answer is no. Everything that you need will be there. The reason that you're seeing some July 2023 is that before every exam, I talk about the prior exam and the upcoming exam. I will do that same thing in late January, early February of 2024. So if you want to watch what I said before the July 2023 exams, great, go ahead. That's an optional thing to do. We will update all of that for the other part that I think is important here is that this is an opportunity for you to get a feeling for what we think are important about the exam. And it gives you a little bit of a trend line. So that's all that's going on. But we update material all the time. And Amanda, I know you're in charge of some of those updates. There's constantly new material coming in. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're always making sure that we're getting the most up-to-date releases of questions and getting our model answers out. Yeah. There's a lot of new stuff coming in. There's more than enough in the course, but we're always making sure we get that new stuff in. Yeah. And you can always look in your update center where we post when we've made changes that are significant. So you don't need to ask us. We'll post it there when we put new things up. Okay. Then we, I, I got some uh, comments from people talking about uh, their experience on the bar exam, people that were having some challenges or difficulties and, and were not successful on the test. And I wanted to share with you one of the comments because I thought it was a really interesting problem that this student raised. And, and I wanted to get Amanda and Tracy's feedback on it. Student said, on the essay part of the exam, I struggled with recall. I literally was drawing a blank when trying to recall the black letter law. I had legal concepts in my head, but multiple times on multiple essays, I was scanning my brain for the words of the law and couldn't produce them. I knew the direction I wanted to go, but I couldn't get it on the sheet. I want to frame this up just a little bit because I think what this student was experiencing is what a lot of people go through when they try to rely on memorization. They try to say, it must be something in my conscious brain. And if I can just remember that black letter law, that's exactly the language that this student used, then that's what I'll do. And I'll just spit out that black letter law. But fundamentally to the, the principles of this course, that's not how we want you to, to learn or to write. We want you to have a deeper knowledge and we want that knowledge to come more in the form of a, uh, a summary or a paraphrase of the law. You don't need black letter law being memorized. And I think that what happens is that when you get to that point, because we haven't put anything in your brain consciously in this course, then people get really frustrated and they hit that wall. Amanda, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And I also think that the push to memorize something and learn that black letter law and learn it cold, that's what causes a lot of students to not be successful on the bar exam in general. There are so many students that go to law school and are capable of passing this exam, but then we have big box courses or other people telling you in your ear, you need to memorize, you need to do flashcards, you need to quiz yourself. And then something happens on exam day whether that's test anxiety, whether that's fatigue, whether that's just not being warmed up enough, but they're trying to get that memorization out and it just doesn't work as well for high stakes tests. So I think that if you're trying to memorize that law and you're trying to recall that, mem that law, I, it's not a surprise to me that you wouldn't remember it. That's a lot of pressure to be able to... <laughs> try to recall something like that in the middle of a test when you're fatigued and you're on your, you've done two MPTs and now you're on your fifth essay or whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just a tough way to study. And it's a tough way to take the exam. Tracy, uh, I know you've worked with a lot of our students who have had to make the switch from memorization to deeper knowledge. It's not an easy shift to make, is it? It's not, but even when thinking about this holiday season and how you might be wrapping gifts for people. 
for a holiday celebration. And the wrapping paper is the black letter law. But what matters is what is underneath it. What matters is what the gift is that is hidden by the black, black letter law. Simply uh, showing up to the family family dinner with empty boxes that have been wrapped in paper, I'm not going to get you any kudos from the family. And they're going to give you these blank stares, which is exactly what the test examiners are going to do. If you just show up with this black letter law, which is just kind of a, what you need to be able to do is take the law and apply it. You need to be able to show them that you understand what the law is, not that you're spitting it out. It is a hard transition, but it's a learnable transition. And we teach you how to um, make your presence uh, count and to make your gifts count and to make what you're bringing to the, the family dinner um, really get you some points. That's pretty good. You just came up with that right up, up your head. I yeah. did. Yes. Yeah. So I think the, the point here is that if you're studying, study with the mm -hmm. idea you're trying to get this deeper knowledge and not the superficial memorization. It just doesn't work very well. And I think that's just part of what you've got to be prepared to do. And we'll work with you, whether it's at the booster or one-on-one -on -one coaching or group coaching, we'll continue to uh, emphasize that. All right, moving on. We had a student that said, I'm going to shift my UBE test to the Maryland bar, but my MPRE score is not high enough for their jurisdictional requirement. Can I sit for the exam in February in Maryland before having that score and take the MPRE after? The answer generally is yes, you can. And, but it's always wise to talk to the bar examiners directly. We get a lot of these kinds of technical procedural questions, and we can't give you definitive answers. But the, the basic answer is contact the bar examiners. In the same vein, I've gotten some questions from people asking if they can appeal their scores from the July exam in jurisdictions like Florida or the UBE or California? And the answer is generally no, you can't. There's no appeal. Once the examiners have issued their decision, as Jeff Probst says on Survivor, okay. uh, you'll be voted off the tribe immediately and the decision of the jury is final. So there's not much else you can say about that. It's just the reality of, of the circumstances that we're in. But you should be able to, to take the, uh, the exam in a state and then take the MPRE afterwards. It's rarely a prerequisite to sitting for the test. Okay, next question we got. Sue said, I just finished the first five units over the last week, and last night I photo read my first assignment, Crim Law, Crim Pro, which is great, excited about that. I let it sit in my non-conscious overnight, and I started mind mapping today. At first I got a mind map, but after that, my map started to look more like tree branches going from right to left, instead of a clock-like map. Is there a correct way to mind map or create those? It's not going as fast as I would like. So am I a novice or am I getting too deep into the weeds? So there's a couple of different questions there. I'll start with the, the easy one. You can create a mind map in any way that, that makes sense to you. I've seen people diagram it like a flow chart. I like the clock approach because it's just easier for me. If I'm using a computer program like MindMeister, dot com uh, to do my mind maps that automatically creates in that structure, but you can create it in a, an organization or a diagram chart as well. There's no right or wrong way to do that. When it comes to how fast you're going, I want to turn this over to you, Amanda, because I know you created mind maps and you wrestled with this a little bit. What's your, your take about that? I, I think that first I'll start out with saying, I don't think any time spent on mind maps is wasted. I do think that it's really great time spent, but I do think that students can get caught up in trying to make their mind map perfect or trying to make their mind map incorporate everything they read or everything they listened to in the lecture. And I think that might be holding you back from moving forward. So at the same time that I think mind mapping is a great use of time and there's no bad time spent. I also have to hold that you also need to move forward in the course and stick to the time limits and you will make if you're doing it right, you'll be doing, you'll make different mind maps. So let's say you have your torts mind map, and then you come across a question or an essay that deals with intention and infliction of emotional distress. And you're like, wow, I totally missed this all about IED or whatever the creationist. I, I 
I, I missed it. You'd go back and you'd make just a mind map for that or add to your branches of that. So there's not gonna, there's no right or wrong way to mind map. And some people might mind map something more detailed in the beginning. Like you let your S, you let your outline simmer in your head. And what really stood out to you was all of the intentional torts. So you mind map on that, but you didn't any do any of the torts against property. Okay, who cares? They're going to come up later in the course. You're going to get questions on them and that's going to force you to mind map them and mind map them in more detail. So I hope that answer is not too not giving the answer, but I guess as usual, it depends. Yeah, it kind of depends. And it, it is okay. idiosyncratic. People mind map in their own way. The one caution I would give anyone that's starting to mind map is Think of it as an all-you-can-eat buffet. You're going to get multiple opportunities to come back to this mind map, to add to it. You don't have to do everything all at once. So um, be patient with yourself and, and let it go. I think almost everyone that mind maps finds they get better at it as they go along. Tracy, you've seen that. A lot of our students, they start with pretty basic mind maps, and then they start becoming more elaborate and more useful to them the more practice they get. That's true, but sometimes they go off board with it also. So don't worry about how pretty your mind map is. It needs to be something useful for you. Yeah. And if it's useful for you to have a couple of buzzwords and that gives you what you need, then that's all that needs to be in there. If there's a particular concept that you keep sticking on, then you may need to write a few more words on it. But you've got to make sure that when you go back and you're working with your mind map, that it's not just a glorified uh, flashcard system. Because it won't do what it's intended to do if you fall into that habit. Yeah, and you can certainly overdo it. <clears throat> but I'm glad people are mind mapping. I think it's a really positive thing. All right. We've got another question about photo reading. In the photo reading system, we start with uh, to prepare and then preview and then photo flip. And then the fourth step is post view. And we had a question about the post view step. A student said, is there any way to quantify how much post viewing to do as you go through the course? In other words, how long should I take to post view after I photo read a section? Post viewing is really just doing a brain dump after you photo read. And sometimes that brain dump will be minimal. You will have photo read and your brain, your conscious brain to your knowledge will be relatively blank. And you'll just be like, I don't know. I don't really know if I've got many words or phrases or thoughts here. Sometimes it will really provoke something in the non-conscious, and you'll have all of this sort of stream of consciousness, words, concepts, thoughts that just come to mind. All we're trying to do is to work on this idea of how to take the information that you've just been going through and get it out of your conscious brain so that you can then start to work on it in the activation step. I think that the answer to the question is there's no quantifiable way. Post view sometimes would be a 30 second exercise. I would not take more than five minutes to do it. I think we saw that at boot camp that five minutes was plenty for people to do that. All right. So that's post viewing. And post viewing is really activation. It's the start of the activation process. It's fun to see people post view at boot camp, wasn't it? Yeah, it was fun to um, see people post view at boot camp. And I think one of the things that was cool in, in my group is we did together. We did like, our post views together and we did like, a quick brain dump and write things down. And just if you're trying to do it on your own, I think you're just putting down whatever comes to mind. And I think an, an interesting conversation we had at boot camp was, what if I don't remember it from reading it? Remember from photo reading? It's like, it doesn't matter where you got it from. I keep using torch as an example, but if you're previewing, if you, you're doing your brain dump and previewing for crim law, you're just writing down whatever comes to mind. Yeah. But don't skip the step. I think that's the message I want to give you. And if you're at the booster, we're going to talk a lot about activation. It's one of the things I didn't go cover in great detail at boot camp. So we will get to that at the, at the booster. Okay. Next question. You get a lot of questions from people studying for the July 2024 exam. And the question is, when should I start studying? And they never like my answer because my answer is you should be studying now. I can't tell you how many times I get this comment from people that say, put me back into the, the course in March. Yeah, you're not really going to love your life if you start in March for the July exam. And I say this so often, but July, you will appreciate that December, you was studying. 
And if you push it back too far, it gets really intense. I know, Amanda, you had to do it that way under your floor, forced into that circumstance, but it is not optimum, is it? No, not at all. And like your life is just so, it's chaotic. And again, anybody who has to do it, I'm sure that they would change that reality too. For me, I moved. So I was like, by I'm moving. I need to do this. This is my new home. Got to get licensed here. And I couldn't control when that move happened when, uh, when I was freed up to study. So if you can control it, start early. Yeah. Yeah. It, there's really no advantage to waiting. I, I just got to say. And the great thing is if you start now for July, you can be at five or 10 hours a week. But if you wait until Christmas and holidays and then it's New Year's and then it's February is cold and March, there's stuff going on and it's April and oh my God, now you're into it and you're going to really struggle. That would be our recommendation. Another question, and this is a really interesting one to me. I'm geeking out here in my bar exam world. Student wrote to me, they were very frustrated. They were doing constitutional law questions. And there's a bunch of questions in the course that deal with the lemon uh, test in con law. Now, the student was upset because they were getting questions wrong based on their understanding of what lemon is or isn't, which I think is not clear, frankly. The Supreme Court jurisprudence here is not great in terms of the direction. And I, I thought about the frustration because the questions that they were looking at are pre the decisions of the last term. Here's the reality, and Amanda can speak to this. These are licensed questions and they are copyrighted and we cannot change the question, nor can we change what the examiners consider to be the correct answer. Now we understand that, that those questions may or may not still be valid. For the last exam in July, the bar examiner said, we're not testing those particular set of decisions. We have not gotten guidance for February of 2024 yet on this topic. We'll ask the examiners for that prior to the exam. So if you come to a lemon test question in your practice questions right now, just recognize that though that question was written pre 2023, and you probably, in order to get the right answer, need to answer it under the old lemon test. Amanda, do you agree? I don't know if lemon's good law or not anymore. And I'm not sure anybody really does, do they? Yeah, I think that it's probably to be seen. So I think that, you know, that this was the Kennedy decision. And I think that while the court rejects like the use of the lemon test and uses this reference to historical practices and understandings, it, it's like rejecting the use of it, not necessarily rejecting the test. Okay. Exactly. And I think that it's consistent with much of its analysis in other cases during the term, this using of the history that we're going to look at the entire history. I think that irrespective of the court's use of lemon, the court still upholds these foundational principles that the government can't punish an individual for engaging in quiet personal observation, free exercise, and, and, and free speech. So I think that when you think about writing your essays, there are these kind of foundational principles in your understanding of constitutional law. And you know what? This is just another reason why not to memorize black letter law and not to memorize all three steps of the lemon test. Because I think if you adhere to some of these principles and you just make arguments for both sides on your essays, you'll be okay. The multiple choice rate is another thing. And rather than get upset, just be like, oh yeah, I know about the, the new decision. I'm not sure, though, how your answer could really change if you're really reading the Kennedy decision. Regardless of what test you use, I, I don't understand how you can come out with the same answer. Yeah, just, I, I would agree with that. And the, the direction we've gotten from the bar examiners has been, so far, they're not going to touch it because it's not a clear, defined uh, no, yeah. answer. So I think this is, really goes to a deeper question. We're starting to come to that point where people become results-oriented. I understand why that happens. I want you to be process oriented still. I don't care how many questions you get correct. And if you get questions wrong on the lemon test because you were trying to apply Kennedy or some interpretation of that or the dicta from Justice Thomas or some of the other justices, in that circumstance, you're really overreaching and you're really being way too worried about results and not enough about process. When we get guidance from the examiners, we'll let you know the last word from them was they're not testing these things. But they're still in the course because those are still 
questions that have been released. And until the examiners give us guidance and say, take those questions out, which they do from time to time, then we're going to live with them. Don't get too wrapped around the, I would, I would have gotten 20 correct out of my 25, but I only got 15 correct because the lemon stuff is wrong. I Jackson, yeah. can I ask a question for that? When they say they're not testing this sort of thing, I, I don't think that excludes them from asking a question about free speech no, or freedom of religion. It's just so that, yeah, the, decision, right? Yeah. I don't think you're going to get a a question on Kennedy per se. Exactly. But if you don't hear from us, hey, listen, guys, lemon is not good law, according to the bar exam. And I got a free speech question. I would feel confident in using FLA. And if I applied some aspects of lemon and the history of how we treat free speech and free exercise, I would feel confident in my answer. Even if I put a little stuff in also looking at the historical underpinnings and a lot, I made a logical argument. I don't think I'm going to get a two on that. Always. And, and I think that's really the point is there's no right or wrong answers here. It's doing what Amanda's talking about. It's analyzing the problem and showing how you bring the facts to bear. Exactly. These are the skills that the FLA writing system does. This is what IRAC doesn't allow you to do. IRAC puts you in a box and says, you got to have the rule and the elements. And I don't know what are the rule and the elements that we know what they used to be. We don't know what they mean anymore. So you're cutting yourself off from the common sense application. It's a common sense application that shows your lawyering skill. So yeah, I think absolutely what you just said, Amanda, is correct and, and spot on. It's a great question. We'll continue to update you. In Con Law, you'll see some update videos that I've done just to talk about each term and what we think is happening. But we have to look at it in the context of the bar exam. And while there's all the, the real world implications of these decisions, and those are the ones that certainly matter to everyone, the bar exam implications are much narrower. And so we'll, we'll keep you informed there. So thanks for that question. Let's go back to a timing question. We've got obviously a fair number of active attorneys in the course. And as often happens, and, and Amanda could certainly speak to this, I was expecting to be in a student wrote out from November, late November, I was expecting to be in a trial, but the judge changed the trial date. Gee, that never happens, does it? In the February, if those trial dates continue to be the date of, that's used, should I postpone my bar exam from February until July? Yeah. The answer is, I don't think you can do trial prep in February and take the bar exam in February. I just think that's not realistic. Amanda, you got any thoughts about that? Because you have to, you had to go through this. You're practicing. Yeah. yeah I think unless you got an attorney that's like your second and is covering and you don't have to do any of the prep. If you can hand this off, then hand it off. Unless yeah. it's, I like if, unless it's your livelihood. And I know when you do trial litigation, it can be big money for one thing. And that, that gets you through, could be a few years. So, yeah. I don't think there's much you can do there. Yeah, so, I mean, if your trial is, let's say, at, at the beginning of March or mid-March, you do not want to be doing trial prep while you're studying for the bar. This yeah. is a full-time gig when you get down near the end. So it's just the reality. I will point out that in our course, you can postpone as often as you want, any time for, you don't have to give us a reason and there's never a charge for it. So I know in some courses, that's not the case, but with us, we recognize that stuff happens, life happens. So Whatever the reason, if you've got to postpone, you got to postpone. But I would not try to multitask that way. All right. Next question. A student bought our program called Bar Maps, which is a series of mind maps and videos that are time stamped and fast finish uh, audio tracks of the lectures. And the student said, I didn't realize how to integrate it uh, into the rest of the program. Is it a, are the lectures in Bar Maps a substitute for the regular ones? Here's the way I envisioned bar maps when I created it. It's really three different products put together. The mind maps you use right away. We're just giving you the core mind maps for every single subject on the bar exam. Now, it's not fully blown up because we want you to develop the, the more detailed levels, but it's the beginning first and second levels to everything. You want to use those right away as you're going through the, the program. In terms of the videos, what I would do is watch the videos in the regular course first. And then when you come back to review, there are going to be subtopics within 
each subject that you just know you're not as strong in or that you want to review again. There's no reason to go through a three or four hour lecture if you only want to hear a 15 minute snippet of it. So that's where you go to bar maps and you find that section and you just dive right into that to, to see that particular section. So I would use the videos in bar maps probably in the last 30 to 45 days before the exam. And then the fast finish audio is a sound gap version of the audio track. And I would use this after you've been through the, the regular lecture and you've mind mapped and hopefully you've photo read through that. I would periodically run that fast finish at night in, in, as you're going to sleep and just uh, put it there. So you don't need that right away. You want to get through the subject first. Anything you want to add to that, Amanda, about bar maps? No, I think it's an excellent way mm -hmm. to use it. And I, I think it's a great tool. Yeah, I think it's great. Okay, terrific. And if you have not picked up your copy of Bar Maps, it's a great product. And we really like the way it, it helps people get ready for the exam. The student said, if I buy photo reading, do I get a new study guide or how do I make that work? In the course, you will see in blue type under every assignment, there's a photo reading assignment. So you don't need a new study guide. You're just following in the course assignments and you'll see the time limits and the instructions there. In general, what happens is we want you to photo read in about five or 10 minutes and then use the balance of the what would be the traditional study time to create your mind maps. That is the, the process. They also asked what the price of photo reading for the bar exam is. It's a $400 course and it includes some webinars and some additional training and a lot of extra materials. And of course, it, it takes Paul Sheely and Learning Strategies photo reading and it combines it with my training for the bar exam and create something unique and I think very valuable. The other question that comes up typically is, do I have enough time to learn how to photo read? Absolutely you do. <laughs> you got all the time in the world. Photo reading will take you an hour a day for eight days while you're studying from the bar. So very manageable there. All right. Got another logistics or, or application question. Student said, I missed the deadline from the DC bar application. I've been trying to figure out where else to sit. I settled on Maine and I'll make that deadline. Is there specific material for the Maine bar that I need? No. This is one of the misconceptions about the uniform bar exam. It is exactly the same test in all 40 some jurisdictions in which it's given. And so it doesn't matter where you're sitting. Uh, I had a student that, that took the Pennsylvania exam and said, my God, that passing score in Pennsylvania is so high. Should I go somewhere else to take the exam? No, sit in Pennsylvania. And just your score is applicable in any UBE jurisdiction. Same idea here. You don't need state-specific material anywhere in the UBE. State-specific, Florida, California, Georgia. Those are the three states where we service people and where you need specific material. And we've got it, obviously, in the course. Just make sure you check your bar again, because the New England states are famous for Massachusetts. We have a Massachusetts portion that we take after you sit for the UBE at home. Maine, sometimes other states have it. You have to take it before, but it has nothing to do with the UBE. It's just their little, I would think of it as a 10 question quiz. None of them are that hard, but check yeah. your bar site. I don't think Maine has one, but check your bar site. Like they do, but New York does. And I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah, just check. be yeah. on the lookout for that because then you don't want to delay your swearing in when you pass or that you showed up when you didn't have the correct code because you didn't log on and take their test. All right. Next question. This actually, I think, came up in one of your group coaching calls, Amanda. So students said, can I use selective intuition if I don't understand what the question is asking me? Questions are taking a long time and I struggle for minutes on them. Why don't I turn that to you and, and you can talk about the answer that you gave because I thought it was a really good one. Yeah, I'm trying to put myself in that mindset because that was the one that I sat with for like 20 seconds before I answered it. But what I said was, yes, I think you can. I think that you can use selective intuition, even if you don't understand what the question is asking. Because I think when the student asks that question, I don't understand what the question is asking. That begs the or implies that you're trying to figure it out. And you're stuck in this area of trying to figure it out. And I would say, practice not trying to figure it out. Just what do you think the answer is? What did they say to you? What did the bar examiner say to you? 
and what do you feel the answer is rather than figuring it out. Trying to understand what the question was asking begs the question of, are you even using selective intuition? That's how I took that. And I often say my mentoring that when you read the question, I like to make it fun and pretend it's the client there before me. And when sometimes when clients talk, they don't make any sense. Sometimes they call frantically. It's understandable. They're in stress. And sometimes they tell you things that don't matter. And how would they know that? Not their fault. They're just going off and telling you all the things, trying to be helpful. And maybe you don't understand where this is going. But usually when the client stops speaking, you have a sense of where you are legally and what you can tell them. And you're not necessarily trying to figure out their problem while they're talking. You're just listening to the person. And I think that's more of where you want to be. Pretending the bar examiners are a client, you're listening to them. Okay, what's my reaction to that? And not trying to figure it out. Don't try to figure out what area am I in? What are they testing? What are they, what's the trick? What are they trying to get to? Because that's not selective intuition. Yeah. And when the student says, I don't understand what the question's asking me, you're overthinking it. <laughs> the questions are pretty simple. I'm not saying they're easy, but they're simple. They're, they're asking you a specific question. Who's going to win this dispute? Why are they going to win it? What's the, the criteria? That's, that's what they're asking. What I think this student was doing is, is like we were talking about earlier with the, the essay student where they hit a blank. They're trying to memorize the law and, and bring all that memorization yes. and overthinking it. Look, here's what we know based on literally thousands of data points. We are able to tell how long it takes somebody to answer a question. We can do that through the online program. We are then able to tell whether that question was answered correctly or incorrectly. Now, you would expect, I think, based on just common sense, you would think the longer somebody takes with a question, the more chances they have of getting it right. That is not the reality. So the data says that at 90 to 100 seconds is when most of the correct answers are submitted. After 100 seconds, so minute and a half plus 10 seconds, the rate of correct answers falls off a cliff. It goes from 50 or 60% correct down to 20%. So basically, when you get to 100 seconds, if you don't have an answer, you're missing the question. You're just going to get it wrong. You just need to accept that's going to happen. There is no advantage. And that's why I started developing selective intuition when I started getting the data, because the data said the longer you spend on a question, the worse it gets, not the better it gets. If you're thinking that you don't understand what the question's asking you, in practice, I'd go back and try and figure it out and mind map it and see what the question's asking from the answer explanation. But ultimately, what Amanda said, just thinking about it in a practical sense, what is it they want to know? And then just give the response. Don't overthink this. It's a little bit like going to google.com or amazon.com and staring at the screen and saying, why, is, why am I not getting anything? We haven't asked the question. Just ask the question and you get the response. It's great. I'm glad that people are asking these questions in group coaching calls. Another reason to go to group coaching. But I think pretty consistently, if you'll trust the 90 seconds on selective intuition, it works. It just works. And it's when people go longer, it doesn't work. So that's what I'm looking for. Another question I think came up in your group coaching call, Amanda, you had some good ones. A uh, student said, uh, crim pro, sim pro, con law seem to have a common thread that students struggle with. What makes these subjects tougher? I'll give you my answer and then you can draw out your answer as well. I think what makes those subjects difficult is that they tend to feel like random, unconnected ideas. So in crim pro, we got a series of rules. In sim pro, we got a series of rules. In con law, we have a series we call them principles, but they're basically rules. And the problem is that they tend to feel like they're just whizzing past your ears, right? And, and they don't have any connection. And yet, when you start to mind map them, you'll find that there are relationships and connections, and that's what tie, ties the subject together. I consistently see students who are struggling in these subjects, or it could be any subject, really, they pick these three, but they, they're struggling with the subject, and then they start to mind map it, and they say, oh, I see how this particular topic goes with this one. Great examples in con law, People start talking about due process. What is that? There's substantive and there's procedural. How do those connect up? Why are they together? What does substantive due process have to do with equal protection or various other principles? When you start to see those things, that's when you start to get 
a better sense of the, the, the flow or the diagram of a subject. So that's my answer. Amanda, what was your, I'm curious what you said to your student when they asked this. We actually had a group conversation about this one. I wish we could have had it here, but I actually wrote down the random unconnected ideas. And I think that is spot on because one of the things that came up is when I mind mapped Civ Pro, I went from beginning of trial before trial starts and then all the way through and I mind mapped it the timeline. I have to connect this in some way. And granted, not everything fits into that little timeline, but that was really helpful to me. And I drew a lot of pictures. Honestly, I don't know how I got through Crim Pro. I still think it's maybe random, unconnected ideas for me. I don't even remember there being any criminal procedure on the bar exam. I must have blacked out, put that in the back of my mind. And I think the reason I didn't feel, because I was like, why did this student put con law in there? Because I, I feel differently about con law. Con law is very connected for me because it's one of my specialties. And it's not that I'm a con law specialist, so only I can get it. Once you uncover the connectedness, it begins to not feel like that. So I think that was a great answer, which is why I was so curious at your opinion, Jackson, because I don't think I could have really gotten to that in my group coaching. But we did come down to in our coaching call of mind mapping to understand. And so that's tying it all together there, which I think is great if you're anyone who struggles with even one or two of those like me. And I really think Civ Pro and Crim Pro were my two weakest areas if I had them. Yeah, I, th I think that's true. I think if you're taking linear nodes or if you're trying to do flashcards, if you're doing some of these older traditional approaches, you're going to continue to be stuck with the random sense of these subjects or any subject. I think the, the real value of mind maps that I've seen over the last decade is that when you start to put them together, you really do see what the subject is about. And it's a fascinating way to break down these big subjects. This is what the heck is going on here? There is a reason why we've got a body of law called torts and a body of law called contracts and one called Civ Pro and so on, or evidence. And don't overthink it again. Just lean into it, work through it, and follow the process. If you follow the process, what we know is that it will work for you and you should be really be able to answer essays or MBEs. All right. We did it, Amanda. You and I are awesome, man. We got through all the questions. Even with all my elaborating and gesticulation, we did it. Wow. We, we did I'm it. proud Tried of us. We have to know that it's Tracy and Brianna that slow us down. Oh, okay. okay. No. In any event. Great to have all of you with us today. I know I can see from the attendance, we've got a lot of people jumping in here and that means the exam is starting to get more real for you. That's right. It is a challenge to work in the month of December. I'm not going to lie. There's a lot going on. Please make good use of this time. It will pay enormous dividends to you. It'll make your life in January and February so much better. Want to remind you that we are uh, offering the Bar Prep Bootcamp Booster, December 16th and 17th. There's a link to pay your $100 deposit and reserve your seat. I see we've had some people do that even during the session here today. So we are excited. We hope that we are able to form up a class on Zoom to do this. We'll let you know in the next few days. So if you've made a deposit and we don't do the class, you're going to get your money back anyway. So it's not a big deal. There's no risk to you but we're trying to make sure that we get enough people to make this happen. We hope everybody has a great study week. It's good to be back and fun to be here with you. And uh, hope everybody has a great study week. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.